It's time to talk about June's Journey, a hidden object mystery game with a captivating detective story. When you're playing, you solve a mind-teasing mystery of the roaring 1920s while you dive into June's captivating quest to uncover a scandalous family secret and solve her sister's murder. It's mystery, it's danger, and it's romance, and you never know where the next chapter's gonna take you. If that wasn't fun enough, you get to customize your very own luxurious island estate. Seriously, I cannot stop playing. I am already on the third chapter, and I just started recently. Join me back in time in the glamorous 1920s. June needs your help, detective. Download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. Join all the listeners who are listening right now ad-free by clicking subscribe on Apple Podcast, going to patreon.com slash the Murder Diaries pod, or in Spotify, search the Murder Diaries ad-free. Welcome back to another episode of The Murder Diaries. I'm Paige. And I'm Natalie. In the early morning hours of Thursday, June 8th, 1995, Australian model Caroline Byrne was found dead at the base of a popular suicide spot in Sydney. Caroline's death was initially ruled a suicide. However, pressure from her family encouraged investigators to reopen her case and consider that she might have been the victim of a homicide. Not only did they think that Caroline was murdered, Her loved ones believed that her murder was a culmination of an obsessive relationship that Caroline was trying to find her way out of. After 11 years of investigating, a trial, conviction, appeal, and acquittal, Caroline's death remains unsolved. This is her story. You still think it's in my head But I'm walking with the dead Caroline Therese Byrne was born October 8, 1970, to Tony and Andrea Byrne. Caroline grew up with her younger sister, Deanna, and two brothers in Camden, a town outside of Sydney, Australia. The Burns were always a close-knit family, and the children spent much of their time outside growing up. They lived in a rural area of Camden, so they had lots of animals that they cared for, including chickens, lambs, cows, and horses. Tony, who owned a sand and soil business, described the family's lifestyle and home being like Camelot. The Burns were a happy family, and Tony and Andrea always encouraged all of their children to reach their full potential. Caroline was no exception. Tony told the Daily Telegraph that Caroline was a very bright, happy, and natural child. Andrea, who was a public relations consultant, recognized something extra special in her daughter Caroline and slowly helped her move into the field of modeling. Caroline was a very beautiful girl. She had long blonde hair and was naturally tall and thin. She was said by the Daily Telegraph to have eschewed diets and was down to earth enough to love her food. One of Caroline's first modeling jobs was with the Daily Mirror in 1986. She was about 16 years old at the time. At 17 years old, Caroline won the title of Miss Spirit at the Campbelltown Ghost Festival. It wasn't long before Andrea was taking her daughter into the city to sign with the Gordon Charles Modeling Agency. Despite all of this excitement with a budding career, Caroline didn't neglect her education. She earned a degree in psychology from Sydney University. While in college, Caroline continued to have great success in modeling, booking multiple fashion shows and print ads. She was on her way to a great career in fashion. In 1991, Caroline met a young man named Gordon Wood at World Fitness Gym. Gordon was a trainer, and the two quickly hit it off. Three months later, the couple was moving in together. Caroline's sister, Deanna, told the Daily Telegraph that she was really excited for her sister. Quote, Caroline told me he was a caring, fun person, and they were happy together. Unfortunately, in April of 1991, the Byrne family was hit with an unimaginable tragedy. Andrea, Caroline's mother, checked herself into a hotel in King's Cross and died by suicide. She had been suffering from depression following complications from a breast implant surgery and unfortunately intentionally overdosed on a combination of drugs and alcohol. Caroline was absolutely devastated. Just about nine months after her mother's suicide, Caroline attempted to end her own life by overdosing on pills in the bathtub. Fortunately, she was unsuccessful, but unfortunately, her severe depression remained. 
she began seeing a psychiatrist and was prescribed antidepressants. Though Caroline was struggling with her mental health, she still had a lot of things in her life that brought her happiness. She began working at June Daly Watkins, a local school that was developed to train young women in etiquette and manners. Her supervisor and manager of the school, Carol, later told journalist Ben Hills what a wonderful employee Caroline was, saying, I found her to be a very calm person, a very well-balanced individual. She was a role model for all of our students at no time showed any signs of depression. In 1994, after several years of dating, Caroline and Gordon bought their own place together with help from Gordon's boss. In a statement later made to police, Gordon said, we were very much in love with each other. I considered living with Caroline as a dream come true. He said that they had even spoken about getting married and having children one day. Caroline's sister Deanna later told news outlets that her sister wasn't quite ready to get married but that she told her she was really happy with Gordon and insisted that he was a good guy. On June 5th, 1995, Caroline visited her primary care doctor, Dr. Cindy Pan, to tell her that she'd been feeling really depressed recently for about the past month at that time. She told Dr. Pan that her depression had been particularly bad over the past week. Caroline was then referred to a psychiatrist, and she got an appointment for the 7th. The doctor said that Caroline didn't elaborate on what had been causing her to feel more depressed that past week, but she said there was no evidence that she was thinking of harming herself or any suicidal ideations. On Tuesday, June 6th, Caroline seemed to have a normal day at work. According to coworkers, she left work at 2.30 p.m. and planned to attend a modeling job at 5 p.m. She was scheduled to be back at the school working again the following morning, and none of her colleagues had any reason to believe that she wouldn't be back. However, strangely enough, Gordon left a message at the school that evening that said Caroline was ill and wouldn't be coming into work the next morning. He later explained to police that Caroline wasn't happy at work, so the two agreed that She would take a sick day the next day, and they would travel to the Blue Mountains together. The voicemail that Gordon left was later played during trial. It was very vague. Quote, apparently she's undergoing some tests. She's pretty sick. She hasn't gotten over this thing. The doctors, all they've told me so far is that they won't be working for a while. End quote. Gordon had originally left this voicemail for Carol, Caroline's supervisor and the manager of the school that I mentioned earlier. When she received the voicemail, she called him back. But when she did, his explanation of what was going on with Caroline still remained vague. Carol asked if she could speak to Caroline herself, but Gordon said that she was sleeping. He promised that they would call her tomorrow with more information. The next day, as Gordon had told them she wouldn't, Caroline didn't show up for work. This is the same day that she had her appointment booked with a psychiatrist, and she didn't show up for that either. According to those that knew Caroline, being absent and missing appointments, it just wasn't like her. Much later on in the evening of the 7th and into the early hours of the next morning, June 8th, Gordon called Caroline's father, Tony, as well as her brother, Peter. He told them that Caroline wasn't home and that he was worried that something had happened to her. He picked Tony and Peter up from their apartment and they began driving towards the gap. The Gap is a really popular outlook area for tourists due to its beautiful views, but it's also an area that unfortunately sees many people jumping from the cliffs to end their lives. Tony later described Gordon's behavior in the car as bizarre. He said that Gordon screamed repeatedly at him, I love you, you're my father. The Age, a daily publication in Melbourne, wrote of Tony's account to police. Byrne told police that even before they arrived at the Gap, with no indication of what happened to his daughter, Gordon had convinced him she was dead. Unfortunately, Tony was right. Around 1 a.m., Gordon told Peter that he had spotted Caroline at the bottom of a cliff with the flashlight. Strangely, neither police nor Peter could see the rocks beneath the cliff with their flashlights. Whether Gordon had actually spotted Caroline at that time or not, he was correct. 24-year-old Caroline Byrne was found deceased, wedged head first between the rocks below the cliff's ledge. She was actually wedged up to her waist. Her body was just 30 feet out from the edge of the cliff. She was wearing black leggings, a denim jacket, and her white sneakers. When Gordon was later asked by police how he knew Caroline would be there, he said that he just had a feeling and that her spirit guided him to the location. 
when Caroline's body was pulled from the rocks, the injuries to her head and face were so significant that she wasn't recognizable. Once the officers determined how far out Caroline's body was from the cliff's edge, they began to question how she would have been able to get the momentum required to jump out that far on her own. No one seemed to quite understand how Gordon had found her, but the police didn't think too much of it early on. The gap wasn't an uncommon place for people to die by suicide, so it seemed like the obvious conclusion from the get-go. The immediate question in everyone's mind was, was Caroline a victim of homicide or did she end her own life? Rose Bay Police Constable Craig Woods initially concluded his investigation by saying, I believe the deceased was suffering from depression and that she could no longer cope with this and has attended the gap sometime after 3.45 p.m. on June 7th and has taken her own life. However, as time passed, information began to come to light that made it seem as though Caroline had met with foul play, possibly with someone close to her. Caroline's father applied pressure consistently until the investigation was officially reopened and assigned to Detective Senior Constable Brian Wyver. On top of that, the New South Wales coroner did not feel comfortable ruling Caroline's death a suicide. On June 8th, the day that Caroline was found, her boss, Carol, called Caroline's residence to follow up with the conversation that she had had with Gordon. Remember, after he had left that odd voicemail and they had that interaction where he was super vague with what was going on with her? Well, Carol was following up. She said that Gordon told her she won't be back. Carol responded to that with, ever? And Gordon didn't respond. He finally told Carol that Caroline had been run over the night before. Carol was obviously immediately taken aback and asked how she was, to which Gordon responded, if you believe in heaven and hell, she's in heaven right now. Carol said that Gordon then asked her not to tell anyone and to, quote, let them find out slowly. On that same morning, Gordon's younger sister, Michelle, and their mother went to the Gap early to be with Gordon. The three of them ended up driving together to the morgue. During that drive, Gordon's phone rang, He answered by saying, hi, Tony, and then said, okay, we'll say it was a car accident. Afterwards, Gordon told them that Tony didn't want anyone to know that his daughter had died by suicide. Gordon's mother also said that Tony had called her son several times that morning. Tony would later deny that, though. Phone records later released during that trial confirmed Tony's denials. He made no calls to Gordon that morning. As the investigation continued, police began to discover that Gordon and Caroline's relationship wasn't perfect. In fact, there were a lot of things about Gordon that made everyone suspicious. Tony told journalist Ben Hills that Gordon could not let Caroline out of his sight. It was not uncommon for him to call her 10 times a day. He always knew exactly where she was. The detective's findings backed up Tony's reports of this obsessive behavior. He said all of her friends expressed doubts about Gordon Wood. They describe him as unusual. It would appear that he was obsessed by Caroline Byrne. And the view seems to be that even though he was living in a de facto relationship with her, he, in fact, stalked her. One of Caroline's friends that worked at the etiquette school with her told police that on June 5th, she told Caroline that she was going to break up with her boyfriend. The friend then said that Caroline told her she was in the same boat. It's possible that Caroline was planning on ending things with Gordon. With the accounts of how enamored he was with her, this would no doubt have been catastrophic for him. Doubts and concerns continued to grow as police learned more about Gordon and his personal life. The then 32-year-old was employed by a millionaire stockbroker. He worked as his chauffeur and personal assistant. But Gordon, he preferred to call himself this guy's financial advisor. Gordon had recently spent a month in Switzerland with his boss, whose name was Rene, telling Caroline that the trip was related to one of Rene's companies and that it had received a huge insurance payout after a fire had destroyed one of its printing locations. Tony told detectives that just after the fire, Gordon had disclosed to him and Caroline that the fire had been an inside job and that it was the right time to buy stocks in the company. There were also allegations that he had told the same thing to another businessman. In fact, Gordon's mother had purchased shares of the company around that time and sold them for a profit of like $10,000. 
Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Not long after Gordon and Renee returned from Switzerland, which was just about a week before Caroline's death, they were both served notices by the Australian Securities Commission that they would be interrogated under oath about the real owners of a block of 38.5% of the printing company's shares that were being held by two Swiss banks. A businessman who knew both Gordon and Caroline said that Gordon had asked him for a loan. He said that Caroline told him she was afraid. He went on to say that Caroline told him he's doing all these get-rich-quick deals to make money, and he tells me to shut up when I try to talk to him about it. Within a week following Caroline's death, Gordon had taken a total of $2,000 from Caroline's account. During questioning with the police when he was asked about this, Gordon responded, she was dead. She wasn't going to use it. Infuriating. I know. There were also rumors about Gordon and Renee's relationship. The detective questioned Gordon directly about the relationship, and in a transcript from the interview, the detective said, Now I've been informed that on the day of Caroline's death, she did not, in fact, attend work, but she made surveillance of you, and in the course of this surveillance, she caught you and Renee having intercourse. What can you tell me about that? Gordon immediately responded that those accusations were untrue. He had worked for Renee since 1993 and had traveled the world with him. Renee paid for a portion of the apartment that Gordon and Caroline lived in. Some reports say that he paid for the entire thing, actually. He also had paid for clothes, a car, furniture. He had definitely been supporting them in some fashion. Reports also said that Gordon referred to Renee as a father as well as a boss. Though the rumors of a romantic relationship were never confirmed, it was clear to detectives that Gordon and Renee were very close. In February of 1996, Renee fired Gordon. The accusations against him had gone public, and even Renee didn't seem to believe Gordon's story. During an interview with 60 Minutes, Renee said that he believed that Gordon and Caroline had an argument at the Gap and that his gut feeling is that he was there, but he didn't do it. The timeline of the days leading up to Caroline's death were examined closely by detectives, particularly the movements of Gordon and how they connected with Caroline's. Gordon explained to police that he and Caroline had decided she would take a sick day on the 7th and that he would call her boss for her. He said that when he woke up the following morning, the 7th, Caroline was still asleep in bed. When Gordon returned home around lunchtime, he said that Caroline was drowsy and still in bed. When he returned home again around 4 p.m., Gordon said that Caroline was gone. He said that he didn't see or speak to her again. A credit card receipt was later found in Caroline's purse that showed that she spent $7.75 at Caltex gas station on Oxford Street. The receipt showed that she purchased some gas and bought two chocolate Freddo frogs. After he found that Caroline wasn't home, Gordon said that he went out and returned home again at 7. Afterwards, he fell asleep watching television and then woke up around 12.40 a.m. Gordon claims that he was extremely concerned when he woke up and saw that Caroline still wasn't home. He said this is when he got into his car and started driving, with a feeling that Caroline was leading him to the gap. Unfortunately for Gordon, there were many things that contradicted his statements to police. Gordon told police that he went to lunch at a restaurant with two of his friends. Both friends said that they did indeed meet Gordon for lunch, but After about 15 minutes, he took a phone call and left. They were under the impression that he left to pick up Renee. Gordon said that he picked up Renee and another man around 2.30 p.m. Neither Renee or the other man confirmed this. In fact, there was a sighting that directly contradicted Gordon's statement. Two men that owned a cafe near the Gap reported seeing a beautiful blonde woman and two men around 1 p.m. on the day that Caroline died. These two men then went on to identify the three people that they saw as Caroline, Gordon, and a man named Adam. Adam was Caroline's booking agent from her modeling agency. At 8.30 p.m., an artist named John, whose studio was near the steps to the Gap, 
heard loud voices arguing. He described a woman sitting on the street curb crying with her head in her hands. He identified this woman as Caroline. John then described a man who looked similar to Gordon as being the aggressor towards Caroline, shouting and making aggressive gestures. John reported being able to see all this so well because of a streetlight shining down on the scene. He recalled seeing a second man further up the road where it was darker and that the man was dressed in dark clothing. Melbourne's The Age reported, quote, The last time John saw them, the woman and the two men were walking towards the road that led uphill to a deserted reserve with a car park. The concrete footpath gave easy access to the ledge from which Caroline plunged to her death. Police suspected the reserve is where Caroline may have spent the last three hours of her life, end quote. Caroline's vehicle, a 4WD Suzuki Vitara, had been seen parked near the Gaps Cafe around 10 p.m. Around 11 p.m., two fishermen arrived in the same parking area and saw the vehicle as well. Police found it in the same area after Caroline's body was discovered. The fishermen alleged that there were two men with Caroline that night at the Gap and that the two men left in a vehicle that was driven by the man that arrived second. This basically mirrors what the artist John was saying. Around 11.30 p.m., the same two fishermen heard a female cry loudly and sharply. Meanwhile, 270 yards away, John, who had seen the trio earlier, heard the same scream. Not long after that scream, the two fishermen said that Gordon ran towards them and asked if they'd seen a woman. They said they hadn't, but they told him about the scream that they had just heard. Then they said that Gordon yelled, Oh no, she's done it, before running back off. There were so many holes in Gordon's account of what had happened on the day of Caroline's death, but witness accounts formed a more sensible but concerning timeline with Caroline's movements that day. Years passed with the coroner who conducted Caroline's autopsy continuing to publicly state that there just wasn't enough evidence to support the ruling of suicide, even going as far to say a known person was involved in the death. On March 9th, 2004, almost nine years after Caroline was found dead, investigators completed an investigation into her death that they'd been working on for five years, and they submitted this report to the Director of Public Prosecutions to review. On May 1st, 2005, Renee, Gordon's former employer, died by suicide at the age of 66. Since Caroline's death, he'd been charged with insider trading, It's believed that this contributed to a decline in his mental health. In April of 2006, the director of public prosecutions charged Gordon with the murder of Caroline Byrne. Gordon was extradited from London, where he was living, and brought to Sydney on May 3rd, 2006. On the following day, he was granted bail in Sydney's central local court. More than two years later, on July 28th, 2008, the trial against Gordon Wood began. On August 6th, a mistrial was ruled based on juror misconduct. Some of the jurors had made outside plans to visit the Gap and do their own investigation. The court system moved quickly in Australia, and by August 25th, a new trial began for Gordon. The prosecution alleged that Gordon had thrown Caroline from the Gap lookout where she then fell to her death. Quite a bit of the evidence focused on how they didn't believe that Caroline could have jumped and landed as far out from the edge as she did. A case study was conducted to determine, based on different measurements, how Caroline could have ended up where she did. Though she had suffered quite extensive injuries to her head and the upper part of her body, she had no injuries to her lower body or any damage to her clothing below the waist. Unfortunately, because the death was initially ruled a suicide, a crime scene was never established and no photos or evidence were taken. A physicist and PhD spearheaded this case study, The experiments were conducted with the use of a swimming pool. Four men took turns throwing a woman of Caroline's same weight into the pool from different areas, angles, and they used different throwing techniques. They even tested just using two men throwing as well. In another experiment, several female subjects were chosen, none of them exceptionally athletic. They went through several tests to indicate that they were of average female athletic ability. Each of the females was then asked to run four meters towards the end of the pool and complete three feet first jumps and three dives. They also tested the woman's running speed and how far they could jump horizontally. More tests than just those were conducted, and ultimately he found the following. 
given that the decedent was reliably estimated to be average or below average in athletic ability, I concluded that she could not have jumped or dived at sufficient speed to land where she did. This was actually not the first case study that he had conducted on Caroline's case. Between 1998 and 2004, he created six different reports, all with different conclusions than he'd come to most recently. However, when police contacted him in 2005, they reported that Caroline's body had been found further out than they had originally believed. In fact, it was a difference of nine feet. Remember, no photos had been taken at the scene as initial reports believed it to be another suicide at the Gap. With this, it was concluded that Caroline must have been thrown. Another piece of testimony was brought forth by Caroline's former boyfriend, Andrew. Andrew was a police officer at the time of Caroline's death. He said that the morgue attendant told him when Gordon came to see Caroline's body, he was allowed to hold her hand and say goodbye. The attendant told Andrew that Gordon, in a much less appropriate manner than I'm about to say it, asked if he could see Caroline's breasts. The attendant said that he obviously declined that. Gordon's defense argued that the police's initial ruling of a suicide was what truly happened. They emphasized Caroline's history of depression as well as her suicide attempt following her mother's death. Gordon also reported that Caroline once attempted to jump off a building, but that's unconfirmed. The defense also brought up the fact that Caroline had seen her doctor just a few days prior to her death and told her about the depression that had become more severe lately. They alleged that all of this pointed towards Caroline having made the jump that night from the lookout on her own. Almost three months from when the trial started, the 12 jurors were sent to deliberate. After five days, the jury returned with a verdict. On November 21st, 2008, they found Gordon guilty of murdering Caroline Byrne. He was sentenced to 17 years in prison and required to serve a minimum of 13 years. Deanna, Caroline's sister, said that the family was deeply satisfied with Gordon's conviction and sentence. She told the Sydney Morning Herald, I thought of how our joy was his misery, and that he would be spending many, many years in jail. But then it was gone. Deanna told the newspaper that she hadn't yet visited her sister's gravesite in North Ride, but explained that she had her own way of remembering Caroline. I'm not religious, and I have my own way of saying goodbye. I know people find it unusual that I haven't but it's a very personal choice. Maybe I'll go one day when it's important for me to, but only when I'm ready. Caroline's father, Tony, who'd believed all along that his daughter had been a victim of homicide, was relieved at the closure that came with the conviction and the sentencing. Unfortunately, the Burns family relief was short-lived. Gordon persisted that he was innocent. He was finally granted an appeal hearing on August 22nd, 2011. His attorney explained that they believed the guilty verdict to have been unreasonable and that there was no evidence to support his client murdered Caroline. They brought up a photo that had been submitted by the prosecution. The photograph was intended to show the shrubbery near the fence line where Caroline was believed to have gone over. It was originally reported to have been taken in 1996. The shrubbery would have made it impossible for Caroline to have run from a far enough distance to reach the area where she landed. During the appeal, the prosecution admitted that the photo had actually been taken in 2003 and that the assumed shrubbery could have been a shadow on the photo. There had been a 1996 photo that showed no shrubbery, but the prosecution had purposefully entered a more questionable photo into evidence. On February 24, 2012, the Criminal Court of Appeal overturned the guilty verdict and Gordon was acquitted of Caroline's murder. The appellate judges unanimously ruled that the evidence submitted did not prove that Gordon was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. He was released from jail after serving three years and two months at the Goldburn Correctional Center. In 2017, Gordon sued the state of New South Wales for $17.8 million in damages. His lawyer said that the investigation was flawed and biased. The Guardian reported that the lawyer also said it was always intended to find my client guilty of murder, not to get the actual truth. He also criticized the physicist who performed the case studies on Caroline's death, essentially accusing him of being, quote, prepared to fabricate evidence based on the fact that he was writing a book about how physics tied into that police investigation. He went on to tell the courts that it's breathtaking that this man could ever have been put up as some form of independent expert. 
He continued to explain how both he and his client believed that the physicist's testimony and findings were entirely inaccurate because his experience and expertise was in plasma physics, which is a study of different gases. Of this, Gordon's lawyer told the court how that qualified him to give evidence about behavior of bodies when they are thrown from cliffs is very hard to see. It's pretty clear that Gordon's lawyer wasn't happy that this guy was seen as an expert witness. When Gordon testified, he explained to the court that he still didn't think he was over Caroline's death, or even that he ever would be, telling them that, quote, Caroline was and is the love of my life. He also brought up the allegation that the morgue attendant made, claiming that he had inappropriately asked to see Caroline's breast. And no shock here, he denied that he had ever done that. In August of 2018, a judge ruled that Gordon was not maliciously prosecuted by the state of New South Wales for Caroline's murder, and he was not awarded any money from the state. While much of the news coverage of this case revolves around Gordon Woods and the, until otherwise specified, wrongful conviction, it's often pushed aside that there remains a victim in this story, Caroline Byrne. Her death remains in limbo, not currently officially ruled as a homicide or suicide. That's it for today, but be sure to check us out on social media at The Murder Diaries Pod. We're on Instagram, TikTok, you name it. Until next week, stay safe. Bye. Bye. Seeking the truth never gets old. Introducing June's Journey, the free-to-play mobile game that will immerse you in a thrilling murder mystery. Join June Parker as she uncovers hidden objects and clues to solve her sister's death in a beautifully illustrated world set in the roaring 20s. With new chapters added every week, the excitement never ends. Download June's Journey now on your Android or iOS device or play on PC through Facebook games.